Okay, so let me just put that down a minute. This is weirdness. And just one thing, okay. I'm loading, sorry. Okay. okay. Right. Okay, so hopefully this is right. Okay, so it's 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 gone to the, the full screen now. Okay, so good afternoon, everybody. Um, I hope uh, I hope everyone is uh, is okay. Um, so what uh, what we're going to do this afternoon is um, we're going to look look at the let's say the last part of the. Um, last week's session which we were talking about food uh, we're talking about food production um, agriculture in particular um, so what we're going to do today is we're going to finish talking about this aspect of the environmental system let's say um, and we're going to I'm going to pick up on a, a short a relatively short chapter about um, invasive species so that's to do with uh, let's say ecology um, it's also linked to this idea of, uh, of agriculture as well so um, these things are let's say um, these things overlap there's a lot of uh, let's say cross talk between different uh, different sections um, and then uh, this will let's say complete our uh, our rather, let's say, rather long journey through uh, various aspects of, um, the of, of, of the environment system, um, if you like, and this will set, set us up for our last session, which is next time, um, in which I will, um, I will propose uh, a sort of a brief summary of the various pieces that we've done but also more than anything else I would propose that if anyone has comments and questions um, that uh, we you can bring these questions and comments to the uh, to the session and we can have a uh, um, either a debate or a, a discussion about these uh, about these things so um, with that said, um, I'm going to I'm going to pick up from where we left off uh, last time and take a, just one step back, which which is that um, we were talking about uh, agricultural food production and we were talking about um, how um, it's foreseen that agricultural food production needs to uh, needs to increase um, over the next few years. Um, in order to meet uh, growing uh, growing population, um, but also um, uh, there's also a, the aspect of meeting, let's say, market needs as well. Um, and the FAO have uh, proposed that uh, actually there's enough capacity within the current system, within the system as it is. Uh, in terms of um, land availability and resources to um, to meet this need, uh, although this is actually uh, a view which is um, not exactly shared by many people because um, with the changing with the rapidly changing um, climate uh, crisis which is bringing in uh, um, climate variables which are, which can be particularly damaging um, on a large scale um, this has thrown this let's say optimism a little bit into doubt but there's also the other question which is the um, the so-called uh, the hard boundaries of the, of the, of the system which is that um, because of the uh, because of the limits imposed by climate um, you can't grow certain crops in certain places in the world simply because the climate is not adapted. If the climate is changing, this will mean that certain places in the world will become um, uh, potentially more fruitful, uh, whereas certain places will become potentially uh, less um, uh, less fruitful in terms of producing food um, but there are also uh, other boundaries 
um, such as the uh, the, int the integrity of the biosphere, um, <coughs> particularly where crops rely on insects to uh, to pollinate. Um, and as we know, there's there's been a um, we may have read that there's been a uh, a drastic decline in the number of uh, of insect species, um, particularly in um, uh, particularly in countries where uh, or in areas where uh, industrial uh, agriculture is practiced. So that's agriculture on a very large scale. Monocultures, for example, um, where you have um, uh, see it okay. Uh, sorry, I'm just I'm just che sorry I'm just checking the chat to make sure that I'm uh, not missing anything. Okay, um, so where you have uh, monocultures or where you have uh, large scale use of pesticides and a whole set of things, and obviously these uh, these these activities will have knock on effects within the um, within the biosphere within the uh, within the, eco the local ecosystem so for example um, a decline in the number of insect species the insect species may be pollinators for uh, many different plants um, plants don't get pollinated you don't see uh, you don't see so many um, wild flowers because the the niche is taken by uh, plants which reproduce in other ways um, bird populations will suffer though particularly those that uh, involve eating um, insects and there's a whole set of things um, we also should remember that uh, pesticides um, they're not particularly selective they kill insects and there are insects which are uh, serious agricultural pests and there are those which are actually quite useful for the environment so or useful for let's say useful for man's needs okay so if you add into this mix um, the fact that there, are, there will be limits on uh, or there are limits on fossil fuels um, limits to fish stocks um, because of uh, uh, the depletion of non-renewable or only slowly renewable resources um, it's clear that um, optimism is probably uh, misplaced I think uh, we, that's not to say we need to be pessimistic but we do need to be active okay so um, just uh, moving uh, moving through this we went through these uh, these slides last time talking about um, uh, talking about um, globalization the, f the food uh, system um, and also this important uh, this important concept of genetic erosion which is that um, naturally we know that many species uh, many plant species or many uh, species which are cultivated for food um, naturally have quite a quite a, a, a lot of uh, variety um, <coughs> typically um, I mean, there are several good examples I think the, the squashes the pumpkins uh, are a good example of variety because there just seems to be an infinite variety of these things um, some of which are more edible than others um, but the if we think about such things as apples simple apples uh, once upon a time there seem to be many 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 different varieties uh, because apples are actually hyper variable um, but um, in terms of what was what was available as let's say um, what was available in the supermarkets um, the uh, let's say the the um, distribution uh, networks and the uh, supermarkets and the economics of it were that um, people seem to prefer only particular types of varieties and there's also there's also an element of marketing there's an element of psychology and c persuading consumers that they don't really want apples with it which are sort of maybe a little bit ugly and a little bit uh, um, thick-skinned and what have you so what so what this has done over time is it's um, led to a loss of genetic variation 
uh, simply because farmers no longer grow crops, uh, grow the varieties of things which they used to, uh, which they used to, uh, which they used to grow. So, okay, so this was this was where we got to in terms of um, this is where we got to in terms of the uh, let's say the, the the summary of agriculture itself. Um, but there are some new things which are starting to appear on the horizon, which I think uh, it's worth uh, worth looking at, particularly in this context of um, feeding feeding the world, feeding the cities going going forward. Because you will probably have picked up that one of the one of the guiding or one of the the underlining themes uh, in these uh, in these uh, slides that I've been showing is that. Um, there is rapid urbanization and so more and more and more people are moving to cities living in cities being born in cities and dying in cities and um, many people in cities uh, uh, hardly get uh, any contact with the uh, with the um, uh, with the rural environment if they don't actually move out of um, move out of the city at some point and in some places it's almost impossible if you think about uh, places like uh, conurbations like Tokyo which is um, which is a huge uh, basically it's an urban sprawl um, and there are it's not the only place in the world you've got sale you've got um, um, places well London to an extent but you've got uh, European cities tend to be a little bit a little bit different to the modern mega cities because they have uh, typically have an ancient a more ancient let's say um, uh, a more ancient layout or a more, more ancient plan rooted in history so they're not necessarily cities which are born ex novo but you have uh, places which are um, which are really quite uh, quite uh, large, uh, large-scale urban, um, urban environments. Okay, so one aspect of um, the food supply is, uh, which links very much to the idea of um, uh, greenhouse gas production and efficiency, etc., is the idea of urban agriculture, which is um, rather than um, rather than growing stuff halfway around the world and shipping it uh, to uh, shipping it to your supermarket, is it possible to grow things in uh, in cities? And so some people are starting to look into this, uh, and it's starting to become a bit of a. Um, um, no, I wouldn't say a fad because I, I think it's something. There's al there always always have been pieces small parts of cities which are a bit more rural than other than than uh, sometimes surprisingly so um, but uh, the idea here is that um, this this let's say um, the situation which has grown up um, almost by chance uh, could actually be encouraged with a little bit more uh, thought and a little bit more um, uh, a little bit more planning and so the idea is the is of having um, or encouraging farming um, within uh, within cities or uh, in their near uh, near the immediate vicinity okay um, okay this may get confused with uh, uh, community gardening um, it's not quite the same because uh, community gardening is essentially uh, groups of people in a community who get together and say okay we're going to grow some stuff and we're going to share it um, which is fantastic um, urban agriculture is actually about commercial farming okay um, but it's commercial farming in an urban space um, which makes uh, which makes it a little bit different um, there's room for all of this but it's clear that not everybody um, has the time or the desire to engage in community gardening for how, however uh, great that type of activity would be because uh, growing stuff apparent well not apparently growing stuff for um, is uh, psychologically one of the um, uh, one of the uh, one of the let's say uh, a really good way of uh, helping people 
make connections to other people but also to 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 nature as well so um, it can be very therapeutical in some respects. Okay, so uh, what type of um, uh, urban agriculture do you have? Well, um, now there's one type which I haven't mentioned in here, but I will mention it by um, uh, by talking about it, but I'll come to that in a minute. Um, but what are we talking about? We're talking about um, uh, things which can be um, formally organised uh, back, gar back guard or backyard uh, gardens, vertical farming, rooftop farming. Now, the, the example here you can see um, these are um, plants. These are lettuce. It's uh, it's salad type plants which are being grown in um, well, essentially uh, an uh, quite an unnatural um, environment, because one of the key things of uh, one of the key things about urban uh, urban agriculture is the is the massive use of technology. Um, so hydroponics, aquaponics, aeroponics, um, special lighting, and because it's a um, because it's a um, because it's a commercial concern and because it's a commercial concern within a very confined space there's a lot of attention paid to the let's say the the the, the scientific approach in the sense that it's not just sow some seeds and see what grows um, this is uh, there is a lot of uh, a lot of effort which is put into um, making sure that the uh, the mineral concentrations and the, the fertilizer concentrations, etc., are just right so that the plants grow um, in just the right way, um, etc., etc. Now, you can imagine also that people will uh, come back and say, "Well, uh, surely uh, these um, uh, these plants will not taste quite as good, etc., etc." Well, yeah. To an extent, um, and maybe um, maybe this uh, this is something which will certainly in some countries will uh, will make or break the idea of urban agriculture. But in other places where there is no space uh, and you only have big cities, um, this type of approach could become uh, very important. It's it's already quite uh, widely accepted in places like Japan. Um, where um, it's quite it's quite often it's quite often found uh, used to uh, grow particular types of uh, particular types of crops, which um, let's say uh, are easier to uh, easier to harvest in this type of envir environment compared to a uh, having them out in the field. Um, okay, the example, the other example of urban, of urban agriculture, which is uh, extremely well developed, but is not exactly uh, not exactly legal, of course, is uh, cannabis growing, um, which is just an example. It's typically hydroponic or aquaponic. Um, lots of lighting is used to optimize the uh, the production of uh, plants per unit area, but change the plant and you've got a you've got a commercial farm essentially. Okay. Um, now, why would we do this? Um, well, first of all, uh, you can cut the supply chain distances, so you're not wasting fuel um, transporting things from a long distance. Um, We'll see something a little bit later about uh, about waste as well, um, but there's an idea that this type of approach can encourage a local um, a local circularity uh, in the economy. In other words, um, you can have um, local production uh, at least supplying some particular some types of products um, and um, avoiding um, avoiding transport and pollution etc um, the other the other aspect of this which I think is uh, rather uh, maybe not so obvious um, but it's the um, the fact that these uh, environments are extremely well controlled so you avoid pesticides 
um, because you don't you essentially you don't have uh, the plants do not come in contact with pest um, and the uh, th this is this again is quite a is quite an advantage um, because you can uh, you can produce you can produce you can grow plants under very um, let's say very clean conditions uh, such that uh, I did actually have a, a, an interesting conversation with someone who works in the um, the food packaging industry. But this was a couple of years ago, and he told me that um, people are experimenting with this and. One of the problems is that uh, at the moment is that the current legislation, at least in this country, is that um, products like salads have to be washed before they're uh, provided to the before they're sent to the consumer, um, which is okay. However, as he said, the, the problem is that with these uh, with these plants, which are grown under essentially aseptic aseptic conditions, um, there's no need to wash them. Because they're, they're they're already clean, they're already clean. Um, he said that in fact the problem is when you wash them, you make them wet, and that actually uh, that actually um, encourages deterioration, such that they uh, they are uh, they you reduce you, you reduce their let's say useful shelf life. Uh, simply by um, introducing this uh, this this cleaning step. Yeah. Okay. So Elena's just put a uh, put a um, uh, put a note on there. She's saying vertical farm is a great opportunity to have fresh local produce. However, it is still too expensive. But I think this is this is the, this is a very good point, Irina. Um, it is still very expensive, but at some point, it will become viable for certain things. Um, and I think that's the uh, that's the thing. You're not going to grow wheat vertically okay but higher value um, uh, more let's say more difficult uh, more difficult things to grow um, you will be able to uh, at some point there will be a there will, the economics of it will start to work out um, the, the situation there's a note here about the situation in cities because of the uh, of course in cities you've got real estate um, and of course, real estate is that uh, means that um, at some point there's the value of the land. However, um, going back to this conversation I had with this this guy in the food industry, he was talking about uh, how people are reclaiming um, essentially abandoned factories uh, in abandoned, uh, semi-abandoned industrial areas within cities um, and some of these, yes, they can be, let's say, requalified into uh, into housing, but many of these spaces are big and they're absolutely superbly adapted to um, as, uh, as, as, as spaces for this type of uh, this type of activity because you have a lot of floor space um, and a lot of potential uh, vertical space as well. So um, this is something which is coming, but as, it, as the point makes there, all buildings have roofs, and there is actually a rooftop farm in Paris. Um, I think it's still at a sort of a, an experimental stage, okay? Um, and it, but at the moment it covers about 14,000 square meters. Uh, not sure what they grow there. I, th I did read an article about tomatoes. I know that they 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 are supplying the local. Uh, the local schools and restaurants with uh, with tomatoes, um, but it's uh, this is an experimental type of uh, this is an experimental type of um, activity, and the idea is to try and understand how this type of activity can be integrated into. Um, into local supply chains and local uh, food supplies. So, um, of course, you know, the, the question is, is it, is it a fad or is it here to stay? I think it's probably here to stay um, because it's, it, it's, um, it's just a question of understanding how it's, uh, how it's to be scaled and how it's to be done. But I think that um, the, let's say, the the fact that it can be done 
um, and the, other, the the obvious advantages of it um, make it such that, um, as they say, where there is a will, there is a way, and um, some things uh, some things it, some things can't be grown, at least not yet. So, for example, you don't get carrots and root vegetables grown by this method. Um, however, um, salads and stuff. If you're into salads and that sort of thing, there's lots of uh, lots of possibilities here. Um, it, as I say, it can be extremely uh, it can be extremely efficient, particularly when you look at the whole um, uh, footprint uh, of the the carbon footprint of these uh, farming activities. Um, and there's also you also have uh, knock-on effects, or uh, let's say unintended consequences which in this case are actually quite uh, quite positive because by greening uh, by greening um, rooftop areas um, you actually reduce the effects of urban heat islands in large cities which is uh, quite a positive uh, quite a positive uh, outcome okay so it'll be interesting to see how this uh, how these things um, uh, develop. This is basil. This is these are basil plants, um, and I think this was what uh, Lucha was telling me about. Uh, this is a um, this is a, a, a large a large scale um, <coughs> hydroponic um, uh, hydroponic facility which grows uh, more basil than you could possibly grow in the same uh, in the same area. Uh, in the same footprint uh, out in the fields. Um, so using advanced technologies to control lighting and to control um, um, nutrients and minerals and all sorts of uh, all sorts of things, uh, the, the various factors in the in the growth of plants, um, you can actually um, you can actually uh, see how this could be a continuous production of uh, conti continuous production of plants, not just waiting on uh, on the the, the, the season um, the season outside. So I think it's a, it's a, it's an interesting thing, and I think it's uh, I think it's definitely something which will be um, which will become uh, inter become useful uh, more more widely used in the um, uh, in the future. So there's another another comment here on the chat. I'm just having a look at this. And it's, uh, let me just see if I can find out who it is. Okay, Kamal has just said there are buildings covered with ivy. Everybody has walls as well as roofs. Might be some projects uh, where walls are used. Yes, of course. Um, the problem with ivy, um, ivy is is good for let's say um, uh, it's good for um, uh, let's say keeping walls cool, but it does destroy the walls because the roots get into the walls. However, the, I think the point that Kamal is making is that um, you can imagine that with a little bit of um, a little bit of imagination, a little bit of ingenuity, um, vertical spaces, large vertical spaces which are facing the sun. Uh, could be uh, could be uh, potentially um, useful for uh, this type of activity. Okay, um, so typical crops, you're talking about leafy greens and herbs, so if you're a lettuce fan, and there are no slugs here, if you're a lettuce fan, fantastic, because they're not, they're not root crops. Um, these are extremely easy to grow, uh, the squash family, uh, courgettes, are extremely easy to grow. Um, tomatoes, of course, mushrooms, well, mushroom growing has been done for a long, 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 long time. Um, but also fruits, soft fruits like strawberries, raspberries. Um, so you, you've got quite a, quite a variety of stuff. As I say, you're not going to replace, you're not going to replace uh, wheat or grain or anything like that. But you've got um, a lot of possibility for supplementing. Okay, so um, that's fine. Uh, this is just, a, let's say, a different way of growing more or less the same stuff. Um, but what about inventing new foods? And I know this is, this is rather a contentious issue, um, 
and uh, particularly uh, at the let's say at the global level, this is a there is a key difference between um, the EU and uh, the US in this because there there is a uh, whereas the EU operates on a precautionary principle, so you don't do it until you have enough evidence that it doesn't cause harm. The US system is completely the opposite, which is you do it until you, someone complains about it. Um, and so we have this uh, this idea of the so-called Franken foods, which is a, a portmanteau manteur of the um, Frankenstein and food. Um, so let's have a look, see what uh, see what sort of stuff we've got here. So. Um, I don't think we'd usually associate uh, carrots with uh, with being Franken foods because I think uh, carrots are sort of fairly, let's say, innocuous uh, things, which you know, sort of they're, they're bright orange and they um, they seem to be sort of reasonably tasty. They're reasonably sweet and what have you. Um, however, they're definitely the ones that we find in the supermarkets these days are definitely not definitely not natural. Um, most of these orange ones uh, are actually a variety which is, I think the, the commonest one is called Van Horn. It's a, a Dutch variety. Um, and in fact, the story of why carrots are orange is, uh, is intimately related with, uh, with, the, with uh, Holland, uh, or with the Netherlands, I should say, rather than Holland, because um, uh, Holland is only a part of the Netherlands. Um, but basically, uh, what's happened is that there has been selective breeding in order to um, simply make best use of small amounts of space uh, and limited resources. And this is true in uh, growing fruit, vegetables, um, wheat, grain, whatever. Um, it's it's also true in animal husbandry and it's been true since the advent of static farming in other words when people s decided to stay in one place rather than um, go out hunting for their hunting for their dinners um, and it's clear why because when your uh, when your starting points are um, roots like this which yeah they're probably fairly tasty but they are rather scrawny there's not a lot of stuff there um, uh, it's quite clear that you are going to try to let's say uh, make um, make the most of the the land that you have and so um, so for example carrots were selectively uh, selectively bred um, actually is a political statement <laughs> for the uh, for the orange uh, because the, this came out around about the time of the um, uh, the wars of succession in uh, in Europe in the 15-1600s um, but the the result is that um, we have um, we have bigger better uh, more tasty um, vegetables than uh, than if we were just relying on the um, let's say the original um, uh, the original versions. Um, there are plenty of other examples. Uh, carrots are a great example because they're everyone just very familiar with them. But for example, watermelons, which are part of the um, I think it's the Cubasia family. Um, they are. It's the same family as the as the um, zucchini or the courgettes. Um, they were originally quite small, hard, and they were quite bitter. Um, which is, yeah, small carrots are very difficult to clean and peel. Actually, um, yeah, yeah. But my daughter said to me the other day we were talking about food waste and stuff, and she said about. Uh, um, uh, cooking uh, cooking carrots and stuff without actually peeling them, which I suppose is fine, but you're absolutely correct. Um, also, we're not saying anything about the taste. They could be quite uh, quite different to what we are used to. But anyway, um, thinking about the watermelons, they are quite natural. Watermelons are quite bitter, 
um, wild bananas are full of seeds, uh, so full of seeds that you can't actually see the flesh. It's they're, they're all seeds basically. Um, so, um, looking at the uh, the natural watermelon from about 3000 BC, uh, we've got uh, we've got let's say six known varieties, and they're found down here in Namibia and Botswana. Okay, 80% um, water, 2% sugar, 18% um, other, mostly starch and fat. Okay, the modern watermelon, which is what we would recognize, recognize maybe with black seeds, but uh, you get different shapes. Um, 1,200 varieties grown in 15 countries, but look, just look at the map of where they are. They're all over the place. Okay. Um, and it's 92% water. This makes the big difference. Uh, you've got nearly three times, well, more than three times the uh, the amount of sugar, and there's virtually no other stuff, which is um, there's virtually no other stuff there, and there's virtually no fat at all. Okay, N um, virtually starch-free and uh, yeah, I, I'd uh, okay. Yeah, I'd read that they grow. Yeah, they grow square watermelons to store them more easily. Yeah, I, I'd read that uh, that that was something which was happening. So you know, people have got endless uh, endless invention. Let's say invention here, and it's interesting that here we've gone from um, a very few known varieties to more than a thousand commercial varieties because there's no other reason for growing these things other than to uh, okay uh, than to um, uh, to sell them and uh, so so thinking about uh, some of the changes it's been estimated that modern fruit and vegetables contain only about two-thirds of the minerals and vitamins that they used to contain um, now this is particularly I, I think this is referred to apples um, because, as we say, the, uh, if you look at the, the, the case of the watermelon, it's not likely that the uh, original watermelon was particularly nutritious if you could actually eat it, because it was rather it was rather uh, disgusting. Um, so um, the point is that uh, people are active in selective breeding. And they always have been ever since uh, farming, ever since uh, static farming uh, became important in the Neolithic. Um, but m in the modern world, we actually we're, we're even more active than just selective breeding. Um, we're actually uh, using modern technology, modern um, modern approaches to actually play with the genes of the gene pools of, uh, of plants um, and so um, there, is, there are many 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 examples of these some of them are more let's say uh, seem to be more um, important than others um, but for there's an example here which is relatively recent it's about four or five years ago of um, um, scientists producing a type of corn which actually produces methionine which is a, an essential amino acid um, usually uh, corn is rather poor in methionine uh, which is why you need a, a you can't just eat corn you need a, a more varied diet um, but it's a useful way of getting um, methionine into the diet um, if you can grow corn with methionine genes and so genes have been taken from bacteria put into the corn now this in its in and of itself is um, one can say well uh, it's yes it's genetically modified um, is it safe um, if it is safe okay but then there's the other question which is uh, the question which is nothing to do with safety or or whatever it's actually to do with intellectual property and one of the um, I think one of the big let's say objections to GMO 
uh, OGMs uh, in, in Italian is that um, quite often the the companies that are promoting the uh, the special organisms which are modified um, have a monopoly on the um, intellectual property of production uh, and also diffusion and it's the last part which is the which is really ethically the, the point which needs to be addressed because in many cases um, farmers are um, let's say they are tied into the product and they can't escape okay so they may get better yields for a number of years but the problem is that the uh, the, mo the organisms are modified such that they can't reproduce or they can't produce seeds and so the farmer has to buy more seeds from the, the producers um, and so this is part of the this is part of the business model um, so uh, this is one of the one of the aspects but the idea of let's say um, changing the gene uh, the gene pool, uh, changing the um, the genome of a of a plant to make it better in some way is not I don't think is in and of itself is a bad um, is necessarily a bad thing considering that that's essentially what people have done over the past uh, over the past thousands and thousands of years through selective breeding this is something that uh, farmers have farmers have always done or people have always done since the beginning of the dawn of static farming okay so um, now these are examples which are approved by uh, the USDA so this is U the this is the US this doesn't apply to Europe at all uh, because um, they're not uh, they're not allowed in Europe um, but you can have for example carrots that uh, help absorb uh, they produce uh, uh, they produce molecules which help absorb uh, the body absorb calcium um, you have uh, potatoes corn rice which contain more protein you've got uh, more uh, omega-3 omega-6 uh, fats in uh, linseed um, tomatoes with more antioxidants uh, lettuce which contains uh, digestible um, iron so you can see that there are lots of possibilities uh, for uh, modification um, the question is whether these modifications actually cause potential problems and whether they are whether they cause um, let's say ethical problems from a, uh, a commercial point of view okay um, one of the modern really really modern techniques uh, you may have heard of it I'm not going to talk anything about the technique itself is uh, CRISPR uh, the Cas CRISPR Cas9 um, which has been used to um, modify uh, modify bananas to uh, to uh, produce um, pro vitamin A um, now um, this is something which has been uh, done using uh, a banana which is specific to Papu Papua New Guinea and it's been the genes have been used and incorporated and modified into uh, other um, other types of banana okay so uh, this leaves us to, leads us to the idea of the so, the so-called super fruit um, rather controversial uh, so you can have um, this is a rather stupid example which could be that uh, you have uh, fruit that tastes like fish now I can't imagine eating fishy fruit um, but um, the point is that uh, it's in the end from a let's say technical point of view it's just the genome and so it's just just DNA molecules which can be uh, which you can edit and do all sorts of stuff with um, so this is you know this is something which uh, um, could be could be potentially uh, potential well could be potentially useful but it's certainly something which is um, which has been uh, used 
in order to uh, increase yields, increase efficiencies, make food, make certain types of food, uh, fruit and vegetables more um, nutrient uh, nutrient dense. Okay. Okay. So, what about the future of food? So, we talked about um, talked about growing stuff in cities, sort of vertical farms. Uh, we've talked about uh, Frankenfood, so uh, genetic modification of, uh, uh, of playing around with genomes of organisms and um, ob honestly speaking it's something that people have already done. It's just these days uh, it's not farmers in the, in the field, it's, um, it's people in the lab. Um, so what about the future of food? Well, I think before we have a, a little look at this, um, it's useful to look at some some data. Um, and if we think about uh, the calories in the diet, um, this is a, a quite an interesting graph, I think, because the, ca the calories in the diet. Um, if we look at the hundred, look at hundred percent of the calories. So we're not sort of saying how many calories these are, or we're just sort of comparing different types of diet. Um, you can see that um, if we look at uh, if we look at this, the meat lover, um, it's getting a lot of calories from uh, from these these animal sources. Um, the average diet is a bit so this is this is a sort of a hardcore carnival um, this is a, a person who is maybe a bit more average in their consumption of uh, of meat um, someone who is not eating beef okay but if you notice this part of the graph is relatively relatively stable uh, across everyone from vegans uh, to the meat lovers there's not a big lot of change here um, vegans, vegetarians, you're eating a bit more, having a bit more fruit, um, and of course the vegetables take up a bit more uh, space. And as we move towards uh, towards vegetarianism and veganism, we have more space dedicated to cereals. Um, but the point is that um, about well, let's say a third. Just yeah, it's about a third, about 35% of the calories in a meat lover's diet are coming from uh, animal sources. Um, compare that to a vegetarian, and that you've got um, relatively small amount. So it's about just under 10% approximately uh, coming from dairy sources. But this is vegetarian; it's not uh, it's not vegan. If you cut out uh, animal sources altogether then um, we have approximately half, nearly a half, so it's about 45% of the uh, calories are coming from, um, coming from cereal, okay, which is fine, okay, but this is where we need to put this into the context of the, of the CO2 equivalent. So this is the, um, uh, the idea of the, of the footprint, the, your diet's footprint, um, in terms of carbon, in terms of uh, CO2 production. And it's quite clear, um, I would imagine that you guys have already seen this type of data, um, but it's quite clear that the um, even the average data, without going to the extreme of the meat lover, uh, even the average diet um, which has uh, the first, these first three, so beef, uh, chicken, dairy, that's the, this part here, um, there is a huge contribution to the carbon, uh, let's say, the carbon dioxide production from these these parts. So it's the it's the animal part which is producing the the, the greenhouse gases. Um, if you look at the uh, the vegan diet, which is the let's say the other extreme, um, the let's say the main contributors is actually it's difficult to say which is the main contributor because you have uh, a fair balance between the cereal uh, the vegetables the fruits and the oils uh, this is all relatively sort of uh, well balanced so um, what's the deal here well the deal here is quite simply that um, uh, the 
carbon footprints of these meat-based diets is one of the uh, is one of the problems uh, of um, associated with global warming because again we we have to remember that it's not just driving cars which produces uh, greenhouse gases but it's also um, the agricultural system which is use which we are using to provide us with uh, with our uh, energy okay so um, in the context of a reduction I think quite a few people are actually starting to get around to the idea of reducing the amount of uh, particularly red meat is very is uh, is quite um, co2 intensive in terms of its production and I think quite a few people are coming around to the idea of uh, of, uh, of reducing meat intake um, what sort of alternatives uh, do people have? Well, um, there are many, let's say, many different proposals. Um, algae, uh, seaweed, is uh, is um, actually it's quite it's already quite uh, widely used in the in Far Eastern cultures um, because it's uh, it's nutrient rich and it's actually relatively easy to cultivate. Um, so it's uh, it's a relatively straightforward um, uh, source of uh, source of nutrients. Um, it has a relatively low environmental impact, and remember that in many cases, many places in the world, um, there are actually natural algae forests, undersea forests, if you like. Not that I'm advocating that they should be cut down. It's just to demonstrate that this sort of thing can be uh, can be grown on a relatively large scale um, but uh, of course this is not to everybody and not to everybody's taste what about this what about these guys um, I think everyone's probably going eeg okay um, this is uh, obviously we're talking about uh, um, insects okay um, now, for anyone who is a Dr. Zeus fan, I'm a, I'm a great Dr. Zeus fan. Um, I couldn't resist this. Uh, if you ever get the chance to come across the the book um, Green Eggs and Ham, some people don't, some people don't like Dr. Zeus, but uh, um, I think he, I think he's, he's just brilliant, uh, a brilliant educator. Anyway, um, would you could you in a car? This is from the this is a. Uh, the story is uh, it's two two characters, and one of them is trying to persuade the other to eat green eggs and ham. Okay, and the guy is saying, "No, I don't. I really don't like them. I don't. I don't want to." Have you ever tried them? No, but I don't like them. Okay, and so you can see where the the, the story goes. Um, now, uh, I don't know whether I would actually eat them like this. Now Car um, Maria Carmen is saying that she, I've never tasted insects but of course there is the joke about um, uh, what's worse than finding a worm in an apple finding half a worm in an apple okay so who knows <laughs> who knows when it all gets <laughs> When it all gets mashed up, who knows what's in there? Okay, and I think that's actually the that's actually the key to this. So um, it's called entomophagy, uh, eating eating insects, and it's rather curious because um, you probably don't realise that uh, uh, insects are actually a very good source of protein and nutrients, um, and they are. Um, they are part of the diet for about two billion people on this planet so that's something like a third of the people on the planet actually culturally in a culturally accepted way eat uh, eat insects or arachnids okay um, and in fact there's a there, I think there's a there's a place in Thailand uh, where they uh, every year there's a sort of a there's a season, there's a, a small, there's a brief period where the um, uh, the spiders, local spiders, uh, breed, and there are just billions of these things, and people will just eat them. 
because they because they're apparently they're quite tasty. Um, I remember in uh, going to visit friends. This was a long time. Well, what time? Long time ago. Going to visit friends in Chicago, um, and in the U.S. Now, okay, in the in in Europe and in the Middle East, uh, there are cicadas. Okay, uh, these insects which sit on the trees and chirp away <coughs> in the summer. And the warmer it gets, the the faster they <coughs> stridulate. Okay. Um, and in the Europe and middle, the Middle East, these cicadas come out once a year. They come out in the summer. Now, in the in North America, though, um, there are two types of cicada, and they have two different time uh, periods. One works on a period of something like seven years, and the other works on a period of something like thirteen years. So they don't. They're, they're not there every year, and so. <laughs> and people make a real fuss about them when they appear. Um, and I remember see, my friends showed me uh, showed me some uh, newspaper uh, cuttings from um, from that summer because uh, they said the, the cicadas were here; they were out. And they showed me photographs. It was just unbelievable because the um, everywhere the, the, the streets were just covered with these insects. They just come out and they bred, and they were all over the place. And there were people, um, well, uh, picking them up, and they were they, they were co coating, they were cooking them, and coating them in chocolate, and eating them, and doing all sorts of weird things. It's just anyway. Okay, so. Um, as far as as far as insects are concerned, of course, um, industrial uh, from on an industrial scale, we've had silk farming for a long time, um, <coughs> farming silk in, uh, insects for um, uh, producing silk. Um, but maybe <coughs> it's this, the idea of farming insects for food is a little bit more um, uh, a little bit more. Um, a little bit more recent. Now, um, let's have a look at some uh, some some data because again, we need to be thinking about data here. So, um, if you look at um, the percentage of the of the of the protein source, which can actually be used, which can actually be eaten. Now, say not you. I shouldn't use the word used. Um, which can actually be eaten because, of course, uh, bones and skin and stuff get used get used for other stuff. Um, you can see uh, it's quite clear that something like crickets, 80% um, of the uh, of the of the body of the the cricket is essentially available as uh, a protein source. Um, whereas compare that to chickens and pigs, that's about 55%, and cattle is even lower at 40%. So it's quite clear that from a, let's say an, in, uh, an efficiency point of view, there's a lot more stuff kilo for kilo in uh, crickets than there is in a kilo of, uh, of poultry or in cows. Um, but then. If we add to this the um, the idea of the uh, the environmental impact, so this is the greenhouse gases from the production of a kilo of protein. Um, I think this graph just says it all. Basically, um, uh, your steak is actually quite uh, damaging from an environmental point of view compared to um, compared to a kilo of protein from crickets okay now of course um, the you know the, the, let's say the pleasure from eating a steak is not going to be the same <laughs> as the pleasure of maybe eating a plate full of crickets I'm not sure but if we're just talking about protein as protein uh, in which case it doesn't matter what form it comes in um, it's quite clear that uh, this is a huge it's, well, it's an, as they say, it's a no-brainer. Okay. Um, what about uh, what about the um, the conversion? 
of the animal feed. Now, if you remember way, 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 way back in one of the first uh, one of the first talks, we we talked about um, uh, the efficiency of going down a food chain, and essentially this is what this is what we have here. So um, you can see that uh, the amount of uh, animal feed going into a going into a, a cow and the amount of stuff coming out is really rather inefficient compared to a uh, a cricket or a, an insect okay um, in terms of animal feed in processed meat out um, from an economic point of view um, if you can get over the squeamish factor and maybe that's just uh, uh, that's just a, a cultural thing. Um, it's a no-brainer, 90% profit. <laughs> okay, so I'd suggest we all give up and go and uh, 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 that we all give up and go and start farming uh, locusts or whatever. Anyway, what um, this is a curious one. Most commonly eaten insects worldwide, um, termites, uh, other. I suppose that will include ants and stuff. I've seen chocolate color, chocolate covered ants advertised in Texas. Uh, caterpillars. I think uh, this is for relatively well known. Uh, grasshoppers, um, lice. Now this doesn't sound very nice, but I suspect it's to do with the um, the, the definition. Of the uh, of the animal, not necessarily that we're eating um, uh, lice from other people. Okay, so um, if you want more information on this, I suggest you go and have a look at this. There's a university in um, Holland uh, or in the Netherlands. Sorry, I keep calling it Holland. I should call it the Netherlands. Um, Wageningen, Wageningen, which is um, it's an agricultural university, and they are at the forefront of uh, of these uh, these types of things. Okay, what about alternatives? Um, for those of you who are um, old in the tooth uh, or long in the tooth, I should say, uh, you may remember this film from the 60s. It's called Soylent Green with Charlton Heston. Um, um, there's a Matt Groening uh, cartoon, um, but let's not get that extreme. Um, what about this? Uh, this is the so-called impossible burger. Um, and again, it's this idea of to make it acceptable, we have to make it seem like the real thing, although it's not the real thing. Okay, so we have to make it pretend. Um, now, apparently, these burgers, well, when they first started about 10 years ago, were, weren't, so, weren't so great. Um, but apparently now uh, they are almost, almost able to fool um, top class restaurant critics. So um, they've come on a hell of a lot. The first lab-grown burger cost three hundred and fifty thousand uh, dollars. That's obviously um, because it, you're taking into account all of the cost of the of the of the research, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But now, the same technology, which is obviously being developed and completely changed, um, is able to produce is able to produce extremely tasty meat tasting burgers for uh, about twelve dollars which is uh, obviously now within the range of a, uh, a gourmet uh, burger let's say um, and the apparently the secret to the taste is the is the heme is using heme which is obviously a molecule in blood um, but uh, for the vegan burgers um, the heme is produced by bacteria in a tank, or it's produced by plants, in, uh, or um, by um, microorganisms uh, through fermentation. So uh, you're producing something which is, in, let's say, intimately associated with uh, with meat, and it's going absolutely nowhere near a cow at all. Um, and so uh, the question is why? Um, so you've got uh, impossible burgers that are substituting beef. You've 
got chicken. Apparently, this is already on sale. This is quite widely on sale in Israel uh, since a few years back. Um, chicken nuggets, which contain absolutely no chicken whatsoever, but they taste exactly like the real thing. Well, I mean, again, uh, it's just it's just protein, and part of the I think part of the challenge here uh, that people are trying to sort of get around is the idea of um, simulating the f not just the flavour but the, the texture, um, and that's the that's one of the key things. Uh, you need chicken to be sort of stringy, so it it has the, the the chicken sort of feel to it. Okay, but why why do this? Well, the key is um, it's to do with uh, greenhouse gas emissions because by growing uh, protein um, in a lab, now the protein could be sourced from insects, for example, and using that protein, because in the end it's just, it's just molecules, um, reassembling those, uh, those molecules into, um, into something which is, uh, which, which, which resembles uh, a, a piece of meat. Um, this is, uh, you know, this is something which will make it more uh, more acceptable until people start to actually uh, embrace the idea of being able to do all sorts of stuff, um, being completely free of uh, of the confines or the constraints of of the piece of meat itself. Um, so greenhouse gas emissions, above all. Because by doing it this way, you're not you're not engaging in intensive farming, and thinking about you know thinking back to um, to this type of uh, let's say economy of calories or economy of um, efficiency. It's quite clear that um, this is not very it's not a very efficient way of uh, of doing things. Um, so, uh, and then of course for those of you who uh, who are, uh, let's say, more vegan oriented, um, there's the ethical concerns as well. Now let me just see, someone's just put something on the chat here. Uh, so, okay, right. And yes, when I was at the railway station with my daughter and we ate hamburgers. My hamburger was for vegan people and the other one was made with meat. I tasted both and I wasn't able to find any difference between them. Yeah, exactly. Because the thing is, in the end, quite often, uh, this type of food, if you think about it, it's one thing if you're eating uh, a Fiorentina, uh, a, a steak, or um, uh, what is it in Spain, a chuleton de Avila. Okay, one of those huge pieces of meat. It's one of those, it's one thing if you're eating that. But if you're eating a burger, which is highly processed meat anyway, with lots of sauces and a bit of salad and stuff, um, so the whole thing is just a, let's say, a, a mishmash of tastes, quite, uh, you know, quite often uh, there's no real need for the thing to actually be, um, to have any, you know, let's say, noticeable difference. So... Okay, so um, the other thing here, of course, is uh, 3D printing. Um, this is curious. Go on the internet, uh, go on to YouTube and uh, type in 3D meat or 3D printing meat and you will be amazed at what you, you will find. Um, it's unbelievable what the, the imagination that people are putting into this, okay? Um, so uh, they print the meat and they print the fat in it too. <laughs> okay, so 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 coming back to uh, coming back to the themes, uh, the, I think the other big theme for today is this um, uh, is the theme of food waste. So um, the 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 whole let's say the whole food production chain. From uh, producer all the way th distributor through to consumer is um, potentially full of waste, and uh, the FAO, uh, in a report a few years ago, um, made this statement, which is rather 
rather sobering. If food waste were a country, it would be the world's third largest emitter of greenhouse gases, CO2, after China and the US. In other words, when we waste food, we're not just wasting the food that we're, that we're not eating, we are wasting the resources, all of the resources that went into that food and went into getting that food into our kitchen, onto our plate. Or into our fridge okay so the idea of um, food waste is a very very important uh, um, concept particularly when we think about well in all of this environmental stuff um, what can I do where's my what's my role what, what can I uh, what can I do here how can I contribute um, now some people, uh, some people uh, maybe already have the habit of not wasting stuff. Um, I'm thinking, I'm thinking, for example, of my my mother-in-law, who uh, she was of a generation where um, sometimes in some periods, because she lived through the lived through the, the Second World War, um, as a as a child uh, or as a as a young person. Um, and there wasn't a lot of food around, and so the idea of wasting is absolutely an, an anathema. It really is something which you you just don't do. Um, but of course, when you're brought up in a in a situation of plenty, um, you don't quite often you don't sort of uh, give it a second thought. And of course, oh well, you can recycle. Um, but we have to remember always remember that with food waste it's not just the it's not just the calories it's not just the the stuff on your plate it's the resources and the water and everything that's gone into making that okay so uh, some statistics here um okay so it's estimated that Americans in the US they waste about 141 trillion that's 1000 billion calories worth of food every day that is a hell of a lot of calories okay 165 billion dollars worth of food every year okay that's a lot yeah let's think about cruises tons huh? yeah no no exactly exactly yeah pleasure pleasure okay now I'm not saying that we all have to go around um, wearing sackcloths and hair shirts and whipping ourselves and what have you that's not that's not what I'm saying but the, something has got a little bit out of hand here um, in the in the EU it's estimated that um, 88 million tons of food are wasted every year for a total cost of 143 billion euros which is not too far away from the US numbers to be honest with you um, where is the these are this is data from the uh, uh, from the EU um, European Commission and uh, approximately half is household waste in food um, the rest of it now this refers to the uh, EU agricultural um, system which is relatively efficient okay but where is it being wasted? It's being wasted in some being wasted in production, some is being wasted during the processing, some is being wasted um, in the distribution, okay, and some and some is wasted in the food service, okay. So wholesale and retail is distribution, and um, this is supermarkets and stuff. But I think we've already we're already hearing more and more about um, uh, about uh, supermarkets giving away food um, uh, to food banks uh, that's uh, close you know that's getting close to its uh, its sell by date and what have you just thinking of a local place near us um, they started uh, instigating a policy of um, at seven o'clock uh, on a weekday, um, if you go along, um, if the the bread and any of the any of the uh, the roasted meats and stuff, because they, they they cook the meat uh, uh, in the moment, 
um, is sold at a, I think it's 30% discount or it's sold for 30% of the price or something like that, which is obviously good. But as my wife pointed out to me, um, it's also, she's noticed that if you go along at that time, uh, quite often there isn't so much stuff left anymore because they've used it to not overproduce, but to understand how much they actually need to produce without wasting uh, too much. So, but the point is that there's a lot of stuff which is, uh, which is wasted. And as it says here, while an estimated 20% of the total food produced is lost or wasted, 33 million people, and this is in Europe, okay, so this is Eurostat, uh, cannot afford a quality meal every second day. So, yeah, we, we need to we need to act, we need to be thinking very carefully about this. Okay, um, and it contributes to it contrib contributes to eight to ten percent of annual greenhouse gas emissions because, as I said before, it's not just the it's not just the let's say the the food value itself. Or the, or the the caloric value of that food um, it's all of the stuff that's gone into it and not just growing it but cutting it processing it distributing distributing it okay and so this is uh, this is a uh, let's say a, um, I think it's a, quite an interesting uh, approach uh, which is this idea of stop uh, and think and um, don't waste you 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 start off with the idea of not wasting so you think twice about um, you prevent waste before it before it happens if you can't prevent it you optimize it so you redistribute it to people first then the then animals okay um, and then there's a whole set of there's a whole set of let's say um, uh, there's a whole set of hierarchy here from recycling down through to uh, disposal. Um, okay, how is it wasted? Well, um, in the fields, a lot of stuff is wasted because of uh, crop uh, crop pests, diseases, uh, inefficient transport, inefficient methods of harvesting, um, deliberate throwing away. Okay, so uh, it's quite clear that you can do you can do quite a lot here as that as the graph here shows half of it is in households um, but uh, where is the food wasted um, well um, it's the production the post harvesting harvesting handling and the storage and consumption which are accounting for 75% of all food waste now um, excuse me there's a rather <clears throat> a rather curious uh, thing, which is uh, um, the movement about ugly vegetables, for example, uh, ugly fruit. Um, I think this is in uh, in California, in the U.S. But you can imagine the situation that um, uh, there's a there's a, a certain, and this is this is the power of marketing. There is a certain image of what fruit and what vegetables should look like and so my carrots aren't perfect um, so they can't be uh, they can't be sold and so um, it should be uh, discarded um, so this is again it's, it's this it's the cultural thing which is that uh, there's nothing wrong with this stuff it's just a, it's just a weird shape okay um, and uh, okay, so rune has gone. Okay, that's fine. Um, but th the thing is that uh, quite a lot of the stuff that's thrown out is still perfectly, um, is still perfectly, uh, um, is still perfectly fit for fit for eating. Okay, um, so let's just think about this. Wasted food is wasted water. So if you consider the water content of these different types of fruit, when you're throwing uh, these things away, um, 
you're throwing this water away and in some cases this water is actually quite a precious resource uh, locally for where these things are grown um, and so uh, this is a um, Uh, this is uh, this is something which is well worth uh, well worth considering. Okay, um, so wasted food is also wasted land because if you think around, think that around uh, now here it says 1.4 billion hectares of agricultural land, which is equivalent to nearly 30 percent, nearly a third of the world's total agricultural area, is used to produce food that is never eaten. Okay, that is the area of the US, India and Egypt put together is used to produce food which is never eaten. Okay, and also remember that um, because of this inefficiency, uh, there's always a push for more agricultural land and this is a big driver for uh, deforestation. Okay, um, thinking about uh, the role of meat and uh, food waste. Uh, we've seen that meat has an extremely high um, footprint, in, footprint in terms of greenhouse gases um, and this, this is a sort of, this is the dilemma which is um, considering that this is inevitable, the, uh, uh, it's inevitable that there is uh, loss of caloric value simply because it's going through a, an intermediate um, it's this idea of um, thinking very seriously about um, thinking very seriously about the uh, let's say the role of meat in uh, in modern uh, modern diets, modern nutrition. So uh, so it's even more important to not waste uh, to not waste meat. Okay, so I think, okay, I'm here at a sort of a concluding slide, which is um, taking some words from the, an FAO report, which is stating that to permanently and universally achieve the sustainable development goals, and therefore guide food systems and socioeconomic systems in general along an economically, socially, and environmentally sustainable path, a global transformative process that goes well beyond the divide between developed and developing countries is required. In other words, it's not just uh, the idea of more doing more of the same or uh, more pesticides or more fertilizers or what have you. There has to be a change not only in how food is produced and distributed, um, but also what is produced and, um, and, uh, and where it's ending up. Um, and in particular, this is part of this is educating people about the, let's say, the, the consequences of uh, choices um, in terms of um, high uh, high meat diets, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, okay. So that's the that's the uh, that's the end of the the, the section on. Um, um, on food and food production, I think I have to say that it, it, there's some very interesting, uh, very interesting, let's say, um, parts topics in, within this. I think which are really quite uh, uh, well worth uh, well worth exploring in uh, more depth. So I'm going to uh, I'm going to close this one, and I'm going to open the uh, the last one, which is to do with conservation. Now, let me just open this two seconds. And I'm going to... Uh, da -da -da I have to put it on the slideshow. Now, I think you should be able to see this because it's, uh, it's come up as a... Uh, it's come up as a green box. So, um, yes, okay, and yes, it is confirming that, which is fine. Right, so, um, so as I say, I sort of inverted a couple of things because I thought the agriculture one was uh, was perhaps more, um, 
more suited to coming first and then talking about this uh, this aspect rather curious aspect of conservation um, so um, invasive alien species okay so I'm not, I'm not talking about in invaders from Mars here we're talking about um, something a little bit more mundane um, some of some of some things some aspects of which may be uh, quite surprising um, but if we think about um, if we think about let's say local ecosystems um, local ecosystems are typically um, balances equilibria of plants animals um, living in a particular geo location so you have uh, particular soil types you have particular which is governed by the geology you have particular rainfall so you have climate um, you have a whole set of factors which mean uh, that over time um, the animals and the plants that live in a particular area um, let's say um, they create a web which is uh, a web of interaction interactions which is functional to that particular location um, but of course uh, what can happen is things can um, things can um, come into that ecosystem which upset uh, these interactions um, and the effects of these uh, uh, the, the effects of these invaders can be quite uh, can be quite profound, um, and it, the invader, these invaders can have um, effects which are not just environmental; they can also be economically uh, quite uh, quite damaging. Um, and usually, one of the characteristics of these uh, these invasive species is that they are. Um, they are particularly well adapted to exploiting the um, exploiting the, the the environment or the let's say the, the conditions that they find, and they're particularly well adapted to avoiding um, problems from the let's say the local inhabitants. Inhabitants, in other words, the local inhabitants are not adapted to uh, the presence of this uh, the presence of this invader so um, it's estimated this is just an estimate um, that there are over 10,000 more than 10,000 non-native species in Europe um, and approximately 15% of these are considered to be invasive that's 1500 are considered to be invasive organisms um, which are known to have uh, negative ecolo ecological ecological and negative I can only see a small part of the slideshow window I'll tell you what I'm going to do I'm going to unshare and then I will share again okay so just two seconds uh, stop sharing okay and I'm going to reshare it now okay so just bear with me two seconds uh, it should be this and here we go right okay can you see that now is it okay come on yeah no Agnes says yes what about you Kamal it's perfect. Yeah, it must have been something to do when I ch with when I changed the uh, changed the the file. Okay, so that's about fifteen hundred, one thousand five one thousand five hundred um, uh, organisms, animals, plants, whatever, which are considered to have negative ecological or economic impact. Um, but we must remember also that there are amongst these non-native species there are plenty so for example kiwis uh, as the name suggests are not native to Europe um, but they they grown very widely here okay um, 
because they happen to be uh, well adapted to the um, uh, to the climate, particularly in certain parts. So, for example, in northern Italy, there's there are loads of kiwis around where 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 we live, um, and in fact. Um, they have even developed, local farmers here have developed um, different varieties which are not actually available in other, in other countries. So, um, okay, so what about the conditions for, why do, why do these invasions happen? Um, so, this, let's say this phenomenon of, of um, uh, ecological uh, ecosystem invasion is very closely linked to degradation of the quality of, um, of ecosystems in the biosphere. So where you have ecosystems which are weakened by pollution or are under stress because of uh, changing climates, that could be um, water, temperature, whatever, or they're under stress because of what we call fragmentation, which is simply um, in marginal areas where you have, um, let's say, uh, cities which are sort of expanding um, into sort of rural areas. You will get um, uh, you will get fields being dedicated to building, and so you start to fragment the the rural landscape. And this, of course. Um, uh, makes it difficult for certain species to move around. Okay, the classic examples are, are, are wolves. Now, um, wolves need a lot of space, or bears. They're big, and they need they're big. Uh, they're big. Uh, they're apex animals, and they need a lot of space uh, to move around um, and to hunt. And of, so, of course, uh, where you have fragmented. Uh, ecosystems they're not able to um, roam uh, freely with, uh, ha in a way that they would do in a totally let's say totally natural uh, world so um, part of these uh, part of these things uh, so these are some of the conditions but also there's the point that once the invasion starts it can be extremely difficult to stop um, so quite often, since uh, ecosystems are all about competition, quite often there's little competition in the uh, in the new environment, and so they just basically expand. Um, if uh, if the environment is particularly fragmented or polluted, um, pollution can have a big toll on the bigger predators, in particular because of the accumulation. Uh, I think we talked about bioaccumulation in a previous uh, section, um, uh, and so uh, you have the bioaccumulation of pollutants uh, in the the apex uh, predators. Um, this was what caused big problems for <coughs> uh, birds of prey um, in uh, in the U.S. and also in Europe. Okay, and then of course the um, the, the the changing climate patterns can make life difficult for the for the plants which are or the, the species which are local but which um, might be perfectly suitable for the uh, for the invader in fact quite often there are well there are some examples the example would be the, the, the mosquitoes um, there are examples of uh, let's say creeping gradual climate change which allows the um, the invader is actually just extending its range. Um, so uh, th this is something which which uh, which happens quite frequently. Uh, quite frequently. The other thing, which is maybe maybe we would appreciate a little bit less, or maybe not consider so much, is the fact that um, quite often invaders hitch a ride. They they don't intend to invade. It's just that they find themselves uh, in a particular place, and that place maybe gets moved around. So, for example, the classic examples of are the um, every so often you you read the uh, you know the, the funny stories of uh, the Brazilian wandering spider found in a bunch of bananas. 
Okay, well, the Brazilian wandering spider didn't want to go to the UK. Um, it didn't want to scare people in their living room as they were uh, eating bananas, but um, it did want to stay in the bunch of bananas because that's where it makes its nests. Um, uh, so you have animals and plants hitching rides on uh, all sorts of, uh, all forms of transport. Um, and uh, this includes, for example, uh, seeds of plants which get uh, blown into, um, which get blown into uh, containers, or they get attached to animal fur, and the animals get transported. And it can, it, it's, it's quite clear that the whole, uh, the whole thing can be, uh, can get really quite uh, dynamic. Um, but we also have this uh, another another aspect, which is that urban environments in particular offer opportunities, which sometimes local species can take play, can take advantage of, but often um, uh, non autochthonous or invasive species can come in. So a good example is the, the wisteria. Is, uh, this is actually a Chinese uh, plant. It comes from East Asia. Um, but of course, it's particularly uh, it's particularly well liked in certain um, in certain places in uh, in cities because it's quite decorative and it gives quite a, it's quite a quite an impressive display in certain t certain times of the year when it's flowering. Um, and this is a clue to another let's say another route of uh, of invasion, which is particularly for plants which is um, people um, and people will uh, quite happily import uh, plants that they they go on holiday to an exotic climb and they see a plant that they like and they get some seeds and they take it back home and try and grow it and the next thing you know you've got a garden full of whatever it is um, sometimes it's deliberate sometimes it's accidental okay um, there's a whole trade in plants and animals which is often quite illegal um, uh, because these uh, these things can cause uh, can be serious risk for um, for agriculture um, and also for uh, because of pests and what have you okay um, so the urban environments also offer opportunities which are um, not so, let's say, uh, maybe not so um, um, they may be not maybe not so available to the to the local species because they're they're not so um, they're not so hospitable. Okay, so uh, <laughs> okay, so. Um, how do how do how do these things uh, how do these things get in? Well, uh, you've got natural pathways, so you've got the wind, uh, seeds get blown, um, marine currents. Um, there were even reports a few a few weeks ago of um, uh, it was a type of crab which was uh, floating across the Pacific Ocean on pieces of plastic. Okay, so you you get uh, you've, you there is actually the concept which is coming out now of the the plastosphere, which is this um, uh, the this accumulation of materials in certain parts of the oceans, which um, is actually home to uh, very particular, let's say, uh, organisms, very particular ecosystems. There is an equivalent also on land, but it tends to be hidden in landfill, and it tends to be, uh, the environment tends to be at the, the level of, um, um, of bacteria and microorganisms, but you have this idea of a, of, of a very particular type of ecosystem developing around uh, these uh, these resources. Um, so we've got um, intentional introduction, so um, this could be deliberate uh, for, as we, said, as we mentioned, uh, horticultural so that's plants or the pet trade. Um, and 
we shouldn't really label these as either good or bad, but quite often there can be unintended consequences and some examples a little later. Um, unintentional um, uh, is obviously uh, people didn't mean to do it, but uh, it, and it was possibly even difficult to avoid. So, for example, um, the classic example here is uh, ballast water, uh, ballast water discharge. Um, so what you what you have is uh, large ships carrying lots of goods all to around you know, around the world, in different different places. Um, in order to balance the uh, balance the loads in the ships, they take on water uh, in the ballast tanks. Um, in one place, but then when they get to the uh, when they get to the destination and they're unloading, they release this water. Um, and so what you have is you actually have water from one part of the world being um, discharged in another part of the world. But of course, this is seawater, and seawater is full of living things, including uh, things like uh, red uh, the zebra mussel. Um, larvae, which are a type of uh, type of seashell, um, red tide. As is, these are algae, uh, the various uh, life stages of uh, of algae, and so um, this is something which uh, quite often uh, quite often happens. Um, so. This is these are the zebra mussels, for example. We've got a number of different examples of uh, of these of these invaders. We've got um, from around the world. Um, you may have heard of the so-called murder hornet. Uh, this is a type of um, it's a type of hornet, which is uh, which comes from uh, East Asia. Um, and it's ex it feeds on honeybees basically, um, and they are extremely aggressive, um, and they will destroy uh, hives of honeybees uh, quite um, quite easily. Now, uh, in I think it's in Japan where they come from, uh, they the local honeybees have actually uh, actually have a defence against these things. Uh, although it's a, a bit of a, let's say, a pyrrhic uh, type of victory in the sense that lots of honeybees die uh, during the process. Um, but they do manage to defend themselves. And it's interesting because it's, a, it's actually a learned response which has, uh, which has an evolutionary uh, element in it that, in that um, the honeybees, are a, what they do is they gather around the hornets as they arrive and they they basically they pile on them pile on them and they increase the temperature of the hornet such that it basically cooks um, but the bees themselves have mutations in their enzymes which allow them to survive or w which allow a lot of the bees to survive this uh, uh, this process so um, but this is something which has evolved. Uh, it's this idea of uh, co-evolution between the host and the, and the, the uh, between the, the predator and the prey. Um, other types of um, invaders, such as hogweed, uh, this is a big problem in Scotland. It's um, it's quite a it's quite an impressive plant, but it's actually quite dangerous. Um, and it was introduced as an ornamental species in the 1800s. Uh, Japanese knotweed is a similar type of thing. I've got a little bit more information on that in the Netherlands. Um, sometimes uh, things have been introduced to be economically useful. So, for example, in the US, there's a certain type of pear tree um, which was introduced to um, uh, to which was introduced in the late 1800s because it was uh, resistant to a, um, a pest which was which had basically decimated the pear tree, the pear industry, the fruit industry. Um, the problem is these calorie pears, uh, the pears are not particularly fantastic and these things are extremely invasive. They go all over the place. Um, the famous cane toads in Australia, which is a classic example of unintended consequences, 
Um, and then, of course, we've got the expanded range, which are the, uh, the mosquitoes, for example. Um, if we look at principal pathways for marine invasive species, this map is just a map of um, the density of uh, communications uh, across the seas. Now, in this, in this particular case, it's across the Atlantic Ocean. Um, the lighter colours mean, um, I can't remember the, the tonnage, but it's uh, the lighter the colour, the more tons of goods are moving. And so you can see there's an extremely dense um, there's an extremely dense uh, connection between Europe and the US and then also around the rest of the globe. So there are lots of possibilities for these uh, for these species to um, uh, to move around. Now, Kamal has just put an example of Toby fishing is, inv is an invasive species in Turkish seas and lakes. Yeah, I mean these things and th these. Uh, this will probably will have arrived either because someone kept it in, the, in an aquarium and then let it go, or because it was uh, the larvae were in a in a ballast tank and the, the tanks were cleaned when the ship got to the eastern end of the Mediterranean. Um, this stuff happens all all the time. Um, so uh, in, if we're talking about marine invasive species, um, we talked about ballast uh, navigation canals. Just think about uh, a canal like the Suez Canal or the Panama Canal, which are connecting two very different oceans. Um, sometimes you have um, species escaping because um, uh, there's an overflow from um, uh, from uh, aquaculture, so fish farming. Um, the aquarium trade, sometimes people keep stuff in aquaria and then they get they get rid of them when these things either get out of hand or they get sick of them. And then I sort of mentioned this idea of, uh, of the plastic uh, plastic pollution, which is transporting some species across the uh, across the oceans. Um, Okay, we mentioned these. Uh, what sort of effects do these have on uh, on ecosystem services? If you remember, we talked about um, the idea of ecosystems, not just as ecosystems as let's say networks of plants and animals, etc., but we talked about them in terms of providing things to people. So, for example, honeybees are part of an ecosystem and they provide the service of providing honey and pollination, um, etc. So, um, this is an example of, uh, it's not a murder hornet, but it's uh, another Asian hornet which has, um, which is thought to have arrived in France. This is present in France um, and it's since 2004 I mean, before 2004, it was never recorded, but since 2004, it's essentially uh, been found in. Uh, it's been reported in all of the uh, all of the um, all of the areas in in France, and it is now being found uh, in northern Italy, uh, some parts of Spain, and the southeast of, U of the UK. So, um, what's the problem here? It's it's the usual thing with hornets, they eat bees. Um, and so this is quite a, a voracious, uh, aggressive uh, um, hunter of bees. So, um, you know, this is, a, this is the type of effect that they can have. Um, so what can they do? Well, they uh, alter um, they alter the habit, they alter the native habitat, they can cause uh, imbalances in uh, flora and fauna, overconsumption, outcompeting. Um, some types of ecosystems just uh, can't cope, uh, and quite often they're associated with uh, degradation of um, the quality of the water uh, and also spreading disease. Um, because they are able to survive in, let's say, less, um, uh, maybe less, 
rigorously clean conditions in terms of the, the purity of the water, etc. Um, an example here is um, the red tide, which is an algae, uh, and this is just, uh, it's, you know, don't go on the beach during the red tide and don't eat the harvest, don't eat the shellfish or the mollusks. Um, so what sort of effects do these have? Well, um, large economic impacts. Clearly this is a tourist problem. You're not going to go <laughs> on holiday to the beach if it's covered in uh, red algae, okay? Um, and you can also have, uh, have the presence of uh, cholera uh, bacteria. Um, economic damage, um, it's estimated, this is just an estimate, 12 billion euros per year, that's a lot of euros per year, um, caused by the effects of invasive species. So um, Spanish slug, this is this guy here, um, is all over the place now. He's in uh, Europe, he's in Canada, he's in Mexico, happily eats anything just about anything, including other slugs. Um, and it's extremely difficult to get rid of. Um, it's easily dispersed because it lays its eggs in, uh, in soil, uh, it gets dispersed on plant waste, and um, it's, uh, it's very widespread. However, uh, this is an interesting uh, thing that, uh, if you look around on the internet, you would be amazed at what people do. And um, this is a this is a, from a website in Germany. Um, it's called Slug Help. So if you have problems with slugs, I, su I suggest you check it out. Um, and they suggest using the so-called Hanover slug fence. Um, basically, slugs can't climb up this because of the profile. It's a metal surround around a uh, around. Um, uh, an area of soil where you have your um, your plants, um, and the slugs are not able, not f physically not able to uh, to negotiate this uh, <laughs> uh, negotiate this um, uh, this uh, barrier. Let's say. Okay, so as I say, I just find it in, uh, incredible. And they, the, as they point out, well, okay, it's not particularly nice to look at, but it does keep your plants free from slugs as long as there are no slug in slug eggs in the in the soil um, then you will uh, you will uh, remain slug free okay um, how can these things be managed well they it's recommended to um, a combination of uh, detection and responding rapidly um, and unfortunately it requires permanent um, uh, permanent monitoring um, and this is where part of the cost comes in okay so I'm uh, I'm sort of at uh, 28 minutes plus so I'm going to stop there I will pick this up uh, pick, pick this up next time which is our last session um, and uh, I will finish this uh, this session, which we're about halfway through, and then we will have a, a more general. Um, if anyone has any questions or any comments, please bring them to the next. Uh, please bring them to the next session, and uh, we can have a, a bit more of a, let's say, a, an interactive discussion. So. Thank you very much for your uh, for your patience. I hope it's been um, hope it's been interesting, um, and I hope it's been useful. Food, some food for thought. Okay. So, thank you, everybody.